Last week, Netflix dropped its latest buzzworthy project, Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, and I could not stop watching it, binging all 10 episodes over the weekend. Now it tells the unbelievable story of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, a literal monster that killed at least 17 people. He targeted African American, Latino, and Asian young men within the gay community from the late 70s to the early 90s. While other serial murderers may have claimed more victims, Dahmer's crimes were particularly gruesome as they involved cannibalism and necrophilia. If you watched the show and were wondering which aspects were real and which were fake, stick around as we take a deep dive into Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, fact or fiction. And I'll be talking about plot details for the entire season, so spoilers are ahead. So in episode one, we meet Glenda Cleveland, played by Niecy Nash. Glenda is Dahmer's neighbor and is constantly inquiring about the weird smell coming from his apartment. She makes several attempts to get the police to investigate with no luck. Was Glenda Cleveland really Dahmer's neighbor? Well, sort of. The real life Glenda Cleveland lived in the building next to Jeffrey Dahmer's complex. It's possible the writers combined Glenda's character with another neighbor, Pamela Bass, who mentioned Jeff used to make sandwiches for others in the building. Okay, now here's a doozy. Did police officers really return a 14-year-old victim to Jeffrey Dahmer after he escaped? Well, yes, sadly, this is a fact. In 1991, police reported to the Oxford Apartments to find Glenda Cleveland caring for a drugged 14-year-old, Conorak Synthesymphone. However, Jeff had convinced the cops that the disoriented 14-year-old was actually his 19-year-old lover who had too much to drink. After allowing Jeff to take Conorak back to his apartment, the officers returned to their car and before heading to another call, Officer John Balserzak radioed that there'll be a minute and his partner's going to get deloused at the station, which showed their flippant attitude toward the gay community. An hour after they left, Conrad Synthesophone was dead. Once Dahmer's crimes came to light, along with the dismissal of Glenda Cleveland's claims, the two officers were put on administrative leave. After internal investigation, they were fired and reinstated by a judge in 1994. Later in the season, we learn about a horrifying coincidence. Before meeting Conorak, Dahmer actually tried to drug and molest his brother, Samsak, as well. This was indeed true, and Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted of sexual assault of a minor. In episode 3, Jeff becomes obsessed with a jogger, stalks him, and almost beats the guy with a baseball bat. So this is actually partially true. While he never tried to beat the guy with a bat, Dahmer did become obsessed with a jogger and in testimony mentioned that he would have acted on this impulse to kill the jogger if he ever came back. During this episode, we also see Jeff pose for the portrait of his high school's honor society, even though he didn't belong to the group. But did he really? Well, this is actually a fact and his image is actually blacked out like it is in the show. This was also around the time of the killing of Jeff's first victim, Stephen Hicks. In the show, we see Dahmer get pulled over by the police with Stephen's remains in trash bags in the back seat of his car. Even though he was pulled over for swerving in and out of the lane, the police let him go with a warning. Now this actually happened unbelievably at 3 a.m. in 1978. In episode four, Dahmer gets a job at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center and shockingly drinks bags of blood. But was this fact or fiction? Well, it's actually a little bit of both. Dahmer did indeed work at the Plasma Center, but when describing this to law enforcement, he tried a vial of blood on the rooftop of the building, but spit it out. In episode five, we meet Ryan Flowers, who Dahmer leads back to his grandma's house drugs and has every intent to kill but doesn't because of the vigilance of his grandmother and making sure Ron was safe. This is mostly true. While it's unclear if Dahmer's grandmother really was as hands-on as she was in the show, Ron was drugged, sexually assaulted, and ultimately woke up in the hospital. Unfortunately, after police questioned Dahmer, they determined his story was credible over Ron's. In one of the more touching episodes, episode 6, Jeff meets a deaf man named Tony Hughes and falls for him fast. The two enter a relationship, but Dahmer takes his life by the end of the episode. This happened as well in real life, however, according to friends of Hughes, he and Dahmer knew each other for more than a year before he was killed. So a lot happens in episode 7. Here we get to see Glenda Cleveland's side of the story as she repeatedly calls the police to investigate strange occurrences happening next door. However, law enforcement brushes off her claims and fails to respond, resulting in the murder of more people. As a matter of fact, because the police didn't act on her suspicions, she called the FBI, which ultimately decided not to intervene because they didn't have jurisdiction. Another seven weeks went by before Dahmer was finally arrested. Another detail the show brings to light is how Glenda and the apartment manager threatened Jeff with eviction over the smells coming from his apartment. 
This is mostly fiction, as it's unclear if eviction was ever really on the table, but the manager did talk to Dahmer three times about the smell issues. As a matter of fact, it was reported that the manager even helped Dahmer clean out a freezer in an attempt to alleviate the stench. Episode 8 mostly deals with the investigation of Dahmer's crimes after he's caught from his father's point of view. Before sentencing Dahmer, Judge Gardner allowed the family to make impact statements. In an unforgettable scene, Rita Isbell, older sister of Dahmer victim Errol Lindsay, addresses the court and in a fit of rage, charges toward Jeffrey Dahmer and is restrained by court officers. But did this really happen? Well, as a matter of fact, it did. Rita did attempt to lunge across the table and attack Dahmer during the trial. Also during the episode, to the horror of victim families, some are sent a Jeffrey Dahmer comic book from Autograph Hounds. This is another fact. The unauthorized biography retold the life and crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer and ignited a firestorm of controversy in 1982, including a lawsuit by the families of Dahmer's victims. In episode 9, Glenda and the victim's families do their best to move forward despite haunting memories, while Jeff attracts fanfare from behind bars. Remember the two officers that brought Dahmer's 14-year-old victim back to his apartment? Well, in the show, they both receive Officer of the Year commendations and support from their fellow officers. However, this never happened and was most likely written to contrast against Glenda Cleveland, who received a Citizen Award from the Common Council and County Board, which actually happened and was portrayed in the show. By episode 10, Dahmer is a changed man. He believes in God and even gets baptized in prison. This is true as he was baptized in a prison gym whirlpool bath. Another fact that the show depicts is Jeff's shocking death as he's beaten with a metal rod by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver. In the show, Scarver was portrayed as a man seeking God's guidance on what to do about Jeffrey Dahmer. He was also a self-professed vessel of God's wrath. This portrayal may not have strayed too far from the truth as the real-life Scarver told the New York Post that God told him to kill Dahmer. Netflix's series was definitely a better retelling of the famed serial murderer's life than the so-so 2017 film My Friend Dahmer. If you watched it over the weekend, what did you think was the most shocking scene? Let me know in the comments below and if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing for more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next one.